All right, good Thursday to you. Thanks for joining. This is the Sean Spicer Show. I appreciate you tuning in. What a great show today because there's a lot to break down and we've got some great guests to break it down with. Uh, we're going to talk about everything that happened on the House floor today and where we go from here with Larry O'Connor. He's the host of WMAL here. He's a contributor at townhall.com, a Breitbart alumnus, and my former colleague at Newsmax, Grant Cinchfield, the host of a bunch of shows on Real America's Voice. He's got a great podcast. We're going to discuss the Trump case, 2024, the debates, so much to get to with those guys. And then a great new movie is out uh, today in 800 theaters called Mother Teresa and Me. Um, the executive producer is going to join us. He is the guy that helped get us The Passion of Christ, uh, Polar Express, and other great movies. He's going to talk to us about why he backed this movie, how important it is to the movement, and what we're going to do going forward. Uh, with so much filth, out there right now. This is the kind of thing that we need to be supporting. We saw the success of Sound of uh, Freedom. Uh, we saw, as I said, he did Passion of the Christ. So a lot to break down with him, but this panel discussion that we have, where do we go as a movement? What's the future of Matt Gates? What's the future of the party? Uh, was this a good move? Was it not? We're gonna break it down. As I said, Larry O'Connor and Grant Stinchfield, a great conversation with the two of them coming up. A lot to break down. I love Thursdays because we can have a more enjoyable panel discussion with some of our guests that uh, that we can dive into these things, go back and forth a little more than some of the the, the uh, members of Congress, et cetera. Uh, so we've got a great panel headed your way. Uh, talk show host, Larry O'Connor, he's on WMAL here in the mornings. Uh, he was a former editor of Breitbart, TV, dot TV. He's been involved in the conservative movement for a long, long time. He's at Town Hall as well. You can follow him there. Uh, but for those in the DC DMV area, he is a constant present voice every morning. I tend to join him once in a while to help him with the ratings. He struggles and I try to help him because that's the kind of guy I am. You know, I'll get up early to help my friends and Larry's one of them. Just kidding, of course. Uh, I'm also pleased to welcome in my former colleague at Newsmax, Grant Stinchfield. He is a radio host. You can hear him in LA. He's got a, a show on Real America's Voice, and uh, he's the host of the Stinchfield podcast. No one is more MAGA than Grant Stinchfield. I'm going to tell you that right now. Uh, if you follow him on Instagram, you check out uh, his, I don't know if you call them diatribes, but he's always taking it out. He's bringing it down. He's telling us exactly what's going on. Huge supporter of President Trump. Uh, so I'm excited about that. Later in the show, we'll break down uh, this brand new movie that is out today here in the U.S., Mother Teresa and Me, with Paul Lauer. Uh, he's the CEO of Motive Entertainment, which raises funds for these faith-based films. He has produced The Passion of the Christ, Polar Express, The Chronicles of Narnia. I mean, this is a very successful guy. He designed and executed Mel Gibson's grassroots marketing campaign for The Passion of the Christ. And if you think about how successful that movie is, um, you you get it. This guy knows what he's doing uh, and he's very successful and he knows how to pick winners. And I want to ask him about that, where he sees the industry going. All right, you've heard me talk about the wellness company. This is a team of doctors, including Dr. Peter McCullough. You may recall Dr. McCullough. He was out front during COVID uh, with the use of treatments like hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin. Um, this team of doctors that he's part of founded the wellness company, which is all about helping you take control of your health, which is why I want to talk to you about their revolutionary supplement called Spike Support Formula, which was designed out of necessity to find a combination of ingredients that could help you block and dissolve COVID spike protein in your bloodstream. Now, if you've had a bad bout of COVID, spike protein might be a concern for you, and it's something that you can do about it right now to protect yourself. Thousands of people who have taken it have reported better medical clarity, reduced inflammation, increased energy levels. Um, this is getting you back to those pre-COVID feelings that you had. So go to twc.health slash Spicer, use code Spicer, save 15% at checkout. Again, go to twc.health, not .com, .health slash Spicer. You use that code Spicer, you get 15% off. All right, a lot to get to with our panel tonight. Larry O'Connor, talk show host at WMAL right here in the DC area and an editor at townhall.com. He was with Breitbart before that. My former colleague at Newsmax, Grant Stinchfield, he's a host on Real America's Voice, the host of the Stinchfield podcast. 
and a huge supporter of President Trump. Larry Grant, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining us. Uh, Grant, it feels nice, like we're getting the gang back together to some degree. I love it. You know I miss you seeing you on a daily basis. Uh, you know, I watch you on TV all the time, but it, it's not the same as being in the, in the same place. No, time. I know. And, and it, we, were, it, it never, we never were, but there was something about being on calls and being able to be on each other's shows. So this is, we're starting to get this back. And Larry, this is how it actually works. We're allowing you to sit in and watch this, which is nice. I feel so honored to be in the presence of such veteran media yeah. icons. Well, you might want to get a, a pen or something and take some notes. Um, let me just start with this. I don't want to go down a rabbit hole, but I do want to ask you guys sort of a very general question about what happened in the House of Representatives this week. I thought it was striking when the vote for Speaker to vacate the chair came up. The members that, there's, there was a group of members that we knew were going to back McCarthy, okay? But then you had Massey, Jordan, uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene. They are not wallflowers. These are hardcore conservatives uh, that are not establishment. They're MAGA. I mean, you name it, right? I mean, these guys, I was sort of, I, and I was watching the argue, the, the debate, and I felt like, Gates kept talking about 12 appropriations bills and this and that. Do you think that he comes out of this politically as a winner or a loser, Grant Sinchfield, meaning that he wants to run for governor? And I, I saw all of the other Florida reps be like, dude, you're out of here. I'd had Marjorie Taylor Greene on the show earlier this week and I asked her and she said, look, the problem is there's no strategy. He doesn't, there's no, he, she had asked Gates the night before, who's, who do you want? He said, I don't know. And her whole point was, we're going, we're just, you're creating chaos. So Grant, the simple question I want to try to get to is, is this a net political uh, positive or negative for Gates? Look, Matt Gates is a firebrand. The people that hate Matt Gates are still going to hate Matt Gates. The people that love Matt Gates are going to love him even more now. I don't think this hurts Matt Gates with the people that already love the idea of fiscal conservatism, limited government, getting back to the rules of order in Congress. We're all saying, you know what, Speaker McCarthy has been a huge disappointment. Now, ex-Speaker McCarthy, a huge disappointment. The question that will this hurt him in Florida, he wants to run for governor there. Again, I think it gets back to the people on the Gates side are already there. The people not there are, are, are not there. The establishment Republicans are never going to like a guy like Matt Gates, just like they're never going to like a guy like me. So um, I don't think it that's hurts not him. True. Does anything Listen, worse. That's not true. You're very likable. You're cuddly. Uh, <laughs> so you just, you got to get to know you. That's the thing. Thank you. Uh, but Larry, to Grant's point, I get it, except I, I will say this. And that was the point of me bringing up Marjorie Taylor Greene and Massey and Jordan. I, I wonder if he started to, I, I feel like, that, that there was a point in the debate where I was listening to him and I was like, okay, all these are valid points. Mm -hmm. 12 appropriations bills, regular order, moving stuff in. But then right. I was listening to a guy like Massey from Kentucky and Massey's like, listen, he put me on the rules committee. I did this, this, and this. And Massey's right. saying, hey, you can't blame Kevin for an outcome. He's allowing certain things to happen. And I'm like, it's, I mean, Gates was going back. There's 35 years since we haven't had a, a you know, and I'm like, okay, McCarthy wasn't here 35 years ago. How much was it McCarthy's fault? But to Grant's point, I guess what I'm really trying to get at is, did a, did anyone look at this and say, okay, I'm with what Matt Gates is trying to accomplish, but I think he just threw us into a tailspin. He rolled the grenade in and walked out. Um, yeah, I think that guy is one of the, one of the names you've left off that list is Chip Roy. Uh, Chip Roy led the charge in January. Here's Matt Gates saying, hey, we have this list of agreements that Kevin McCarthy has violated. Chip Roy's like, dude, I wrote that list, right? And Chip Roy was on the side of Kevin McCarthy. So I, I don't know. I don't know what if the uh, ultimate question here is, does it help or hurt in right. Florida? Because he is trying to position himself to replace Ron DeSantis. Who, by the way, who, by the way, Byron Donalds, no wallflower, also wants to run for governor. That's right. Uh, I mean, so Grant, you're shaking your head. What, tell me what you think. No, I, th I think if you set yourself up as a maverick Floridian going against the establishment in D.C., it can only help you in the state of Florida. And, and that, that is a good point. I probably agree with you on that, Larry. But to go with what you're saying, you guys are like throwing Republicans into a tailspin. 
Excuse me, we're about ready to hit the ground. We're already in a tailspin. Oh. Tell me one win that Kevin McCarthy has had. Yeah. He's had no wins oh, whatsoever. I'll tell you. I'm still waiting you. for Hunter Biden to be subpoenaed. I got gotcha. you. The one thing Kevin McCarthy do in his power as Speaker of the House where he doesn't need the Democrats in the Senate and he doesn't need Joe Biden in the White House is to appoint the right chairman to run committees and grant subpoena power. He got Jordan. He got Comer. He oh. got Smith. They've been doing a meticulous Larry. job wait, on wait, the wait, Biden wait, wait. investigations. Uh, and McCarthy moved forward with the impeachment uh, inquiry process. That's, that's that what I was going to say. Right now, just so we're clear, everything grinds to a halt, meaning no impeachment here. Right. Here's my point, Grant. The, First the, of all, why biggest, do you say that? Why does it grind to a halt? Because why? you can't. Without a speaker, you, you cannot. You there's can't no subpoena pro, power. The speaker. House, boom, stops. Okay. So when was the last time we had the impeachment inquiry? When was that? Well, we started right. a week ago. Well, yeah, my point is we haven't had another we haven't had another hearing since the first night. We've gotten nothing out of this stuff but hearing after hearing after but hearing. But that's but okay, Nobody's fair enough. Been held but wait, 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 wait. Time out. He had nine months to get us here. But wait, hold on. Wait, hold on. Stop. Time We've out. Nothing since. Okay, first of all, this is the point that Tom Massey was making. Right? McCarthy says, here's the field. Go play on it. I'll open up this goal. I'll open up that goal. You can shoot there. He can't. There's a difference between, and I'm not trying to be an, a McCarthy apologist. I just want to make right. sure we're arguing over the same things. This is where this is where I have an issue with Gates. He's saying I want the I want to have 12 appropriations bills. Great, I'm on that team. I want 12 bills. I want to cut the government. I want to root out waste and efficiencies. But then you can't blame McCarthy and say, well, then none of them passed. He's not running. Every, he's not. He, you want regular order? Then you have he didn't to bring say, go any through. of them. They had DOD in June, Department of Defense in June. They had that bill. He could have brought that to a vote. He waits until September. Fair. Okay. Why? Oh, hey, I, I'm with you. Listen, You're I, right on the, that. The, the one point that I think is fair, and I've asked this to, I mean, this is what Marjorie Taylor Greene and I talked about. You went home for August. You guys, it's not like you didn't know when the test was, guys. <laughs> you knew this was coming. The fiscal year always ends September 30th. But I, I guess my point is all fair points. But at some point, what's McCarthy's fault? What's the system's fault? And what's the the process's fault? And Marjorie had some great suggestions about, hey, we need to not go out on August. We should go out on, on July and be in in August. I think that's a great idea. But my point yeah. is, how much of this is Kevin McCarthy's? Because my point is, is the next speaker going to do anything different? Well, I, I could ask you, one thing I think we can all agree on, wouldn't it have been great if in the middle of the vote, McCarthy went out to the cloakroom and pulled the fire alarm in the middle of it all? <laughs> it would have been beautiful. Wait, yeah. that door wasn't closed. You only pull a fire alarm if you're getting out of a door. That's right. I'm sorry. I forgot about that part of it. Yeah, I don't, without having an end game, a strategy and a plan and saying, OK, here's what the plan is next. Republicans look like they can't manage anything. And this is at a time, Sean, as you know, the polls that came out this week show the Republicans have a historic advantage on every single yeah. metric that voters care about. The one thing we have to do is demonstrate that we can actually get crap done. I'm not on Team McCarthy. I'm not on Team Gates. I'm on team. Get your act together. Yeah. Grant, right. you look like you're so, going to blow a load. <laughs> all right. So I'm talking to two guys. I, you know, I love you both, but you both have spent a lot of time in Washington. Oh, here I'm in go. Dallas. This is not how people think. Uh, Sean, you first said Massey said, well, he gave me a committee. Exactly. No, 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 no. That's why you're voting for McCarthy, because no. he gave you a committee. And Jordan taking over judiciary, he would have crawled through coals to, to, to take over judiciary. We could have anybody as speaker, and they would have given him that position, and he would have gladly taken it. No, no, no. But my point is that there's only the speaker's job is to allow the process to work. You can't be for regular order, which is allowing the committees to do their work and then say nothing got done if the committees didn't do it. You can't have it both ways. You can't say, I want you to be heavy handed, drive the process through. And then at the same time, say, I want regular order, which is allowing the process to work and blame the guy who allowed the process to work. And you you have to pick one well way. We had some of these appropriations bills ready to go. We didn't bring them to the floor. It could have it could have been so easy for him. All he had to do was bring this stuff up, even if it fails. He could have so, said, "Hey guys, I did it. I so did Grant, it." But, but, but Grant, is, let me, is let me, Chip let me, Roy some kind of establishment DC rhino now? I mean, how no, is Chip Roy wrong? In no, his it, it's just a disagreement of where we're headed. So I'm at the point where I talk to people on the ground every day, the voters, the the Trump Make America Great Again, America First conservatives. We're sick and tired of the Washington establishment. And what Matt Gates said is if you're not going to listen 
to fiscal conservatives, America first conservatives, the Trump team in Washington, well, we're going to hold you accountable. And I can tell you, there are millions of Americans like me cheering this vote that went through. Now, am I happy we use Democrats to get there? No, that's the real downside for me. When I look at this, I hate having to rely on Democrats to make this happen. But other than that, hey, the warning shot has been fired. The next speaker better be very but, careful. But let me, let me just, here's the case that I want to make. And Larry brought this up. Right now, the American people are witnessing the consequences of Joe Biden. They're watching a president, domestic policy, interest rates are up, supply chain issues continue to persist, cost of living is up. I mean, you name it, right? Crime. I mean, think about it. last week, Henry Cuellar this week got carjacked because defund the police policies in these major cities. I mean, immigration, the border grant, you're down there in Texas. It's disgusting, right? Foreign policy wise, Iran, Ukraine, Russia, China, North Korea, you name it, whatever, right? All we have to do is not look like, is look like we can actually govern. And my point about this is we now look like we can't even take one no. house and govern. No. The Washington Post thinks that we can't govern. I'm telling you, Americans are celebrating this move today. I don't know. The Washington Post and the New York Times thinks we can't govern. I'm looking at this thinking we did it just fine. All right. I want to tell you about my friends at Bishop Gold Group. Um, these are folks that I've gotten to know over the last couple of years. Um, and during this ever-changing economic landscape that we're all facing, higher interest rates, questions about what we, where the economy's headed, mostly because of Biden, uh, you want to think about how your portfolio is diversified, where the best investments are. And the folks at Bishop Gold Group will give you the confidence you need when it comes to investing. If you want to move an IRA, you want to just start off. These are the guys that in, uh, integrity and know how this is what they do. So if you're a seasoned investor just starting off, these guys can give you the range of options, gold, silver, platinum, palladium, you name it. They can cater to your needs, uh, whether you want to keep it, that you want them to hold it, you want to understand how to sell it. The guys at Bishop Gold Group know it all. Um, I've learned, grown to trust them. Go to bishopgoldgroup.com uh, slash Sean for a special promotion. You can call 844-98416. Or as I said, go to bishopgoldgroup.com dot com slash Sean, you got a special promotion to start your journey towards prosperity. I, I don't I don't think Sean and I are are fed talking points by the Washington Post. All right, number one. And number two, when you talk about how MAGA America First Republicans are cheering right now, well the number one MAGA America First Republican, Donald Trump himself, dragged Kevin McCarthy over the finish line in January. McCarthy is Trump's guy. It so is, I, how is this a victory for Trump and MAGA? when it's actually Trump's speaker that just went down. A year and a half ago, I looked President Trump straight in the eye and I said, Mr. President, him and me solo, I said, I can't stand McCarthy. I can't stand this guy. He's got, he says, Grant, trust me. I have my reasons, just trust me. I said, well, Mr. President, I'm not gonna stop attacking him. You know what he did to me? He winked at me. But here's the point, and this is all like, listen, hold on. The one thing I wanna say about this, and I've, everyone in this audience has heard me say this almost every night. There's a Sun Tzu quote that I butcher every day because I forget to write it down, but it's the following. Tactics without a strategy is the noise before failure, right? So getting rid of McCarthy, okay, if he wasn't doing whatever and that's what you think, got it. What's the solution? Yeah, well, I, we get a speaker that, that will follow basic Ooh. rules of water and common Ooh. sense. <laughs> Look. That's up for Congress to figure it out. I got plenty of ideas who so I'd love to see Speaker of the House. Jim Jordan being one of them. What an amazing speaker that the guy job. would be. Well, I, I by the way, why take Jim Jordan off of the committee where he's spearheading the impeachment right. well, of look, Joe look, Biden? Look, let me, let me do this. I want to, speaking of Donald Trump, I do want to talk some 2024 before we, you know, before the weekend is, is upon us here. Yes. Um, it's funny, Grant, I want to get your take because you, you know, there's a poll that came out this week that the Trump campaign, Dan Scavino and others pushed out that shows after the second debate, Trump goes up five points and everybody but Nikki Haley goes down as well, right? So the first two debates, the unequivocal winner is Donald Trump. He doesn't show up. I've said this from the beginning. It would have been dumb for him to do it. He knows, I mean, like, again, that aside, it's proof positive that everyone who's saying don't go was right. The only people who want him to go uh, are, you know, the, the never Trumpers, the Washington Post, et cetera. He's winning. The more debates that happen, he does better. Well, then Trump 
his team, La Civita and Susie Wiles, put out a statement saying the RNC should cancel the Miami debate uh, that'll either happen at the end of October or the beginning of November. And my point is, why? You've benefited every time these people have done this. I don't, that, that tactic to me actually looked weak. It looked like, well, I, if I were him, I would have said, hey, start having a debate every week. <laughs> or indict me every week, right? The same thing happens, he goes up in the polls. Um, I think you know, Sean, you know, you worked with the man more than I know him, but look, he knows they're not going to cancel the debates. But okay, he's just but, out there spouting, and, and he's and he's and he's making his point, basically saying, "I'm the I'm the gorilla in the room. Nobody can beat me. You might as well cancel all this now." He knows they're not going to cancel, and he knows he goes up every time they have one. So I think this was just President Trump being President Trump. Larry, I maybe, but I also think that if there's going to be a debate where DeSantis is closest rival, the only one within sort of striking points if he's going to have a good debate it's going to be in hometown turf in his state of florida where he just won by double digits especially in miami where he's flipped that area from being pretty solid democrat to republican i think he's just trying to preemptively maybe suggest and undermine the performance that DeSantis could possibly have but i'll say this this is ron's last chance isn't it oh. i mean if he doesn't score big and really move the needle in this hometown home court advantage yeah, but i don't debate. know that there's a, look I, I don't know that you get a home court advantage because you're in a theater or whatever or university of miami like it's not like somehow the audience like the reagan library could have been anywhere ex- that had a that had a backdrop. Sure, you know yeah his, but if it's going to be a crowd like in wisconsin the crowd could make a difference that, that his crowd last stand did, is newsome mm-hmm. It's the Newsom debate. Actually, that's his black let, let me let me let me let me let, let me get to that in a second. I think that's a great point you're bringing up, Grant. But I just want to say, this. so where do you think? Look, I think that Grant's point is right, though. That the RNC can't cancel debates; it has no. to go through it the process. Can. So you'll have this Miami one. They got to have one before New Hampshire and before Iowa. Frankly, they're for posterity, meaning they have to set the precedent that going forward, the party controls these things, and and I'm fine with that. But. I I wonder, I mean, I've always said if President Trump sweeps these early states, Iowa, New Hampshire, Nevada, South Carolina, it's over, right? And and so what, do you think that these debates, I mean, I feel like I get it, we got to go through the motions and have them, but they almost feel like they're pointless. It's a show, not an exercise in informing voters, Grant. Yeah, I mean, these are debates for who's going to be the Secretary of Commerce, maybe, because it's not going to be Vice President. It's not going to be uh, it's, it's not going to be anything uh, uh, other than maybe a cabinet position. Um, I'm just absolutely really upset watching the whole field. I thought we had a deep bench as Republicans, and I'm looking at this field thinking we got a bunch of dorks, losers, wimps, and wussies. <laughs> Larry, I wouldn't go that far. I'll say this: I think that you go through this process for a couple of reasons. First of all. Anything can happen, you guys. I mean, the Democrats aren't having any debates. And I don't know about you, but every time I see Joe Biden, I think he's one step closer to not being on the ticket or even not making it through his final year and a half in office. So you got to go through this process, because if God forbid something were to happen, uh, you want to make sure that you've got things lined up. We're also, yes, looking at potential other roles for these people. But I, I don't know. I'm with you, Sean. I mean, the second they took Asa Hutchinson off the stage, I lost interest. You know I had <laughs> Asa fever for the last I know, but at least you got Doug Burgum hanging in there for you. I, you know what? He's starting to win me over. Yeah. The crazy thing was I thought Doug Burgum did the best of the whole bunch. He actually <laughs> did in L.A. You're right. Hey, hey, so let like, me ask this guy? Let me ask you a silly question. So as I said, according to the – and this is just one poll. It was a national poll. I don't – everyone knows I don't – National polls are, they show some nice momentum maybe, but that they're meaningless. We don't run national primaries and we don't run national elections. That being said, the one that the the donor class seems hyped on is Nikki Haley. She tweeted out this photo the other day of of a bird cage with bird seed because apparently Trump is now calling her like some bird thing. And I want to ask you, like, the thing that I thought was fascinating about this is a lot of people online question whether it was real. So it was a, she was saying, this was outside my hotel room. And a lot of people said, seems a little suspicious that it actually happened. And then the thing that I thought was interesting is that someone put the Trump campaign in, in Sharpie. Normally, if that had happened, like, you know, I mentioned La Savita or Jason Miller, Stephen, J- all these people on the Trump campaign would have posted something and say, hey, we left something for Nikki Haley or something. I thought that it was an interesting thing because no one reacted to Nikki Haley. Like the Trump campaign didn't preemptively try to take credit for it. 
nor did they react to it. And so I'm trying to figure out, is this, was this her trying to do a head fake? Was this that? I, I don't, I was trying to figure out what this was all about. Any thoughts on that, Grant? No, you know, Nikki Haley has been, to me, somewhat of a disappointment, just like Ron DeSantis. These are people that I really liked and really thought highly of along the way. You know, they falter a little bit here or there, but now they're just total disappointments. I just think it shows her her lack of relevance on social media with the crowd that flourishes there. She just doesn't have any yank with them. And so I think people see something like that. Is it a stunt? Is it not a stunt? I I don't know. Yeah, Probably. everything from Carly Fiorina's camp for the most part has seemed really uh, rehearsed and programmed and and just painfully cringe. Uh, except latter parts of the debate where she actually loosens up and starts speaking off the top of her head, and then she calls Vivek Ramaswamy and therefore anybody who supports him dumb. That probably wasn't a good move. All right, I want to take a moment to talk to you guys about Delta Rescue. Um, these are is a great organization. It is a true sanctuary. If you go on their website, deltarescue.org, you will see the amazing work that they do. Animals getting the help, the nutrition, the veterinary care, the freedom to roam about and live happily. Delta Rescue is the largest care for life animal sanctuary in the world. I use the word sanctuary. It's not a shelter. It's a sanctuary. These pets that are rescued, that maybe were abandoned, who knows what other reasons abused, are all taken care of at Delta Rescue. Uh, They get to live out their days peacefully because this is what they do. They rely on our contributions to make sure that they can provide this for all of these animals, the dogs, the cats, the horses, you name it. They need our help. No contribution is too small. Every dollar helps. Five, 10, 15, 20, you name it, 100. If you're Bob Menendez and you've got tons of cash in a jacket or gold bars, that helps too. Go to deltarescue.org. They'll answer all your questions. Check out the website. See the great work they're doing. Again, deltarescue.org. I thought she, that was a, she actually landed the punch. And I think that Vivek was, had been really on the ascent and everything since that first debate. I don't think he is. Oh. First debate, I thought she did yeah. great. I mean, in the second debate where she said, every time I hear you, I, I get dumber. Right, but I I'm just talking about Vivek was on uh, the ascent after that first debate. I even talked to Donald Trump Jr. Everybody was giving him kudos. I think that he tried to suck up too much on that second one. He was like, I respect mm-hmm. all of you and you're my buddies. And, and it was like the first debate, he came out and he was like, boom, 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 boom. And the second one, he sounded like he wanted to get along with them more, Grant. Yeah, yeah, he did. Um I think Vivek has a real problem with China as well. And you saw those people on the stage hitting him hard on China. The (laughs) more I look into this and dig deeper, he really has some issues there with China and the business dealings that he, that he did that he got even further along, which there's no way he is going to, uh, he's really going to have to answer for those things. So, um, I don't think any of them are on any ascent whatsoever. They're lucky if they hang right where they are. The thing is over. Quite frankly. Um, Grant, you brought up this DeSantis debate with Gavin Newsom in Georgia, November 30th. Hannity is gonna moderate it. I, they, it was stalled for a while over whether there'd be a live audience or whatever. I think that the DeSantis team tried, wanted this to be this pivotal moment where they would show they could take on DeSantis. To Larry's point before about the date, and Larry, I'll have you, maybe you weigh in first on this because you brought it up. Like they've, they pushed this. I think they missed their window. They, if it, when, when DeSantis was sort of, everybody was talking about him going into the first debate, if maybe he had had something right afterwards and it, him and Newsom were going at it and he was getting the best of them, you know, donors would look at that and say, wow, here's a guy you can take on Trump yeah. and, and Biden. I think that, I don't know that he makes it to November 30th. I don't, I think that DeSantis's campaign if they don't like I, they've got nothing that's yeah. that's fueling it right now. I think he's still going to be in it at that point. But but at the, but because of the late date, it's going to look like and reek of one last swing for the fences. Desperation yeah. time. And I listen, part of me is excited about the idea. I, the American people are, in fact, in a place where we have to choose. We're at a fork in the road. Yeah. Are we going to go the way of authoritarian Gavin Newsom, Democrat policies in California? Or are we going to lean more toward liberty, freedom, and the way Ron DeSantis has been able to govern in Florida. That's the choice policy-wise we have. The problem is these two guys squaring off with Hannity as a moderator, oh, good Lord, it's going to be an absolute dump. Hey, I've got, I've got, Grant, did you want to weigh in on that? Because I got one more Yeah, just one real quick comment, because, you know, I I live in Dallas, but I do morning drive radio in Los Angeles. So I know this Gavin Newsom. 
This guy frightens me to death. I'm telling you, he is so slick. Oh, Sean, he is. Larry, he is a wolf. This oh, guy, yeah. DeSantis better look out. He's gonna, he may get eaten alive, yeah. and it'll be the end of DeSantis yeah. forever. And it may propel Gavin Newsom. Of all the candidates out there, Gavin Newsom scares him the most. The fact that he's destroyed California, every policy around him, it's not going to yeah. matter to people. He's got slick hair, and he's like Bill Clinton. Uh, that's and, uh, it. He's Bill out. Clinton. He I, is. Bingo. Hey, 30 seconds for each of you, not even if you can keep it tighter. RFK, as an independent, I think hurts Trump. Grant? You know, it's interesting. I think it ends up, this is a horrible answer for you, because I think it ends up evening out. If you look at RFK rallies, they don't look like Trump supporters, but yet there's a lot of the vaccine people that are very angry with President Trump still yeah. that are going to go with RFK. RFK is not a conservative, not by a no, long shot. He's, but he's but, a but people liberal. who would have voted so, for Trump. I, I disagree. I think it hurts Biden. I think it's Democrats who don't want to vote for Biden, but they certainly won't vote for Trump. I don't know any Trump voter who says, oh, thank God, now I can vote for RFK. Jr. No, I no, no, no. But right those were so gettable badly. voters. That's my point. Those were people who didn't like Biden that Trump could have gotten. That's what I think. Grant, uh, Larry, thank you guys for being with us. Wonderful conversation. Thanks, Sean. Yeah, uh, I'll see you at the elitist rhino establishment cocktail party in Washington. Lovely. Sorry, Grant, you're stuck in Dallas. And I'll be getting some barbecue and a beer a little bit later. Right. This is how we roll, man. <laughs> Thanks, guys. All right, that was lively on a Thursday afternoon for you. Now, I want to bring you a great discussion with the CEO of Motive Entertainment. Uh, these are the guys behind the marketing and fundraising of movies like Passion of the Christ, Polar Express, Chronicles of Narnia. Their latest film, Paul Lauer, who's the head of that, is going to talk to us about Mother Teresa and Me. It plays tonight, one night only, 800 theaters. I'm excited to bring you Paul Lauer. Paul, welcome to the show. Congrats on the movie. Hey, thank you very much. So uh, this premieres today in the U.S., 800 theaters. Uh, give me a sense, just since this is your world, not mine, uh, is that what you expected? Did you Were you guys pushing for a bigger release? Is that a bit? I mean, I have no context in, in, that, in the movie world how big of a release yeah. this is. Well, it's actually really good. Uh, it takes about a thousand screens to cover the U.S. Uh, the big, big movies, you know, the Marvel franchise type movies go out on 4,000 plus screens, but that's in every market super deep. Yeah. Where you're, and even the multiplexes where you've got multiple screens within a multiplex, but a thousand screens, you're pretty much everywhere. 800 is just a little less than everywhere. We're just a little shallow, let's say in each market and also real far out in the hinterlands. We may not be there. People may have to drive into a city um, to, to see the movie. So if, if, um, if you can't get to a theater, I was talking a little earlier in the show about kind of the genius behind your marketing. What's the plan to, to allow people to see this beyond being able to go to a theater? Well, we're going to be doing hopefully some encore performances. So it's it's October 5th, one night only, which is a unique theatrical release. It's okay. something that's really only been the last couple of years, maybe the last decade where we're seeing that more because a traditional movie run is at least a week to two weeks. Uh, but for smaller films, lower budget films like this, uh, to get a theatrical or movie theater release, this is this new model where you can do one night only, and it's being done through a company called Fathom Events. In fact, that's the website where you can go to uh, check which theaters it's playing at in your in your area. You can either just search your local theaters for for tonight's seven o'clock show and see if it's there, or go to fathomevents.com and search for the Mother Teresa and Me movie. And that will show you, you, type in your zip code, you can see what theaters But if you can't see it tonight, where do you go? Uh, well, you would, you'd have to kind of wait until we make a further announcement on any encore times, or you can go to our website, mothertheresaandme.film, and it's hyphens in between each word, between Mother Teresa and me words, dot film, and um, sign up, and we'll let you know when, uh, we've got encores in movie theaters or when it'll be coming up on um, streaming. Okay, so let's get back to the nut of this movie. I, I think the thing that is so fascinating is, I, I think that for a lot of us, whether you're Catholic or not, have a vision of Mother Teresa. Um, this is not what I expected. Why, tell me about how you chose to present Mother Teresa because 
uh, th this idea of her struggling with her faith um, is not something that I think comes to mind when you think of her. So how, explain to the audience how you're presenting her and why. Well, most of us look at saints or holy people as people that we could never be because we struggle in our faith, we fall, we think that these saints never had, uh, they never sinned, they never had problems. And the fact of, their, fact of the matter is they all did. And one of the biggest struggles that saints have, in fact, the ones that get even closer to God have this struggle even more, is something called the dark night of the soul, where in your relationship with God, you begin to feel abandoned. And it's very strange that God would allow this in a relationship, this feeling of abandonment. But it's, it's quite easy to understand when you look at Jesus on the cross. Because on the cross, Jesus said, why have you forsaken me? Why have you abandoned me? He's talking to his own father. This is the son of God talking to the father, saying these very words. So there's something extremely powerful in that period that we go through where we struggle in our relationship with God, in our faith, it strengthens our faith. It's just like lifting weights without the resistance or the struggle. There is no growth in the muscle. And this is our spiritual muscle. And it's something that Mother Teresa went through in a very profound way. And we didn't know until after her passing, we discovered, you know, they discovered these diaries where she, or letters that she was writing to her confessor talking about this struggle that nobody would have ever imagined she was going through. And, and so why, what was it that, that appealed to you to say, I want to tell this story? Well, again, because it makes it more relatable to those of us that think we could never be saints. We could never right. um, be like a mother Teresa. The fact is mother Teresa, all of her, all of her outward facing greatness, you know, this incredible love and charity and compassion that she had was in some way being fueled by these internal struggles. Because there's an interesting that happen, thing that happens when you feel like you've lost that connection with God. Where does Jesus tell us in the gospel we can find him? Where does he say, essentially, if you're ever wondering where I am, if you're ever looking to connect with me, here's where to find me. Find me in the poor. Find me in the outcast. Find me in the suffering person. That's where I'll be. And so Mother Teresa, as she was losing this connection with Jesus in her spiritual life, she was reconnecting with Jesus through her love and compassion for those in need because Jesus is in those people. So, so talk to me about how you the, like present the movie. Cause I find the main character Kativa, if I'm saying it correctly, um, I, I found, I found it a very unique way because to me, I've always found it fascinating. When I go to church, sometimes, uh, they'll read a gospel and Jesus will be speaking in parables. And I think the reason he does that is he wants to, to relate to people and to get them to have that aha moment where he says, you know, let you who cast the first, and you stop to yourself and say, well, that's me. Or gosh, now I can't, how dare I judge that person? And yet sometimes I'll listen to the priest say the homily and I'm like, where are you? It's like a history lesson. And I'm like, I'm trying to follow this and that. And the, <laughs> the, the way I looked at this movie was that you were really telling, you were connecting with people through the main character in a way, to your point about Mother Tracy, that was that was rather relatable in terms of the struggles that so many of us have. But explain to the audience who the main character is and this relationship that she, I mean, she's pregnant and what, what you're trying to get the audience to understand and why. Yeah, such a wonderful way that Kamal, the director and the writer uh, presented this. He created a fictional character. Her name is Kavita. <laughs> that was almost exactly what you said. Uh, she's a young woman living in London. She has a boyfriend and she finds out that she's pregnant. And the first thing that her loving boyfriend does is dump her. He wants nothing to do with this. We can relate to that. I think many young women have that experience. And Kavita needs, she, she goes into this depression 
Her parents want her to have an abortion. Everybody around her is saying, get rid of the baby. Um, you know, you need to move on with your life. You've got this whole life of he- ahead of you. And um, she's seriously contemplating the abortion. And then she decides, you know what? I just need to get away for a while. And she goes back to India, where her family is originally from. And she connects with her old nanny. And it turns out her nanny works with Mother Teresa's home for the dying. And so her nanny invites her to come and visit the home for the dying and just completely get her mind off of her struggle. Actually, the nanny doesn't even know at this point that she's pregnant. She just thinks she's here because she's struggling through something. But it's Kavita's journey. She never meets Mother Teresa personally, but she begins to hear Mother Teresa's story because Mother Teresa lived before her time. Yeah. She hears her story of struggling. She has this experience of um, personal contact with people who are struggling just like she is, except they're struggling physically, you know, they're people that are dying. And through this process, she rediscovers what's important to her. She rediscovers kind of her, her base for um, meaning and purpose, and it heals her, and it gives her strength to face her situation. And the film is so not preachy. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing that the word Mother Teresa is in the film. You think, okay, well, this is going to be a religious movie. It's not a documentary. It's live action. It's a story. And it is the last thing from Preachy because it doesn't even come out and tell you this is what you have to do about abortion. It just allows the, the, the main character, Kavita, and the audience to go on this journey of discovery, ultimately about how sacred life is yeah. and how sacred um, uh, suffering is and how suffering can actually propel us forward to meaning and purpose and, um, and fulfillment. And that's what Kavita finds. So, you know, Paul, I, I was mentioning your company, you guys go out, you've been the, the sort of the engine behind these movies to get them. You get these great directors um, who, who do put put the stuff together and then you go out and sort of make sure it get it get it out there get it to 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 market if you will how do you choose your projects well this project actually came to us a couple of years ago and we were too busy to take it on i'm i'm catholic um i've spent most of my career working in the um secular Hollywood world, and even on the marketing side, mostly with evangelicals and Protestants, not so much Catholics. But this movie came along, we were too busy for it, and then it came back around, and I felt like Mother Teresa was literally saying, (laughs) Paul, come on. I gave you one shot, I'm not going to give you two. Exactly. And so uh, we absolutely accepted it the the second time around. We had a little bit more bandwidth and availability, and... um, I just got so excited because I, I feel like, you know, there's this huge market, the faith community, Hollywood is salivating over the, this faith community because they see when it flexes its muscle, it translates to a lot of money at the box office. Um, but so many of these films are so preachy yeah. that after you've seen four or five of them, you're like, been there, done that. I don't want to see another sermon on film. And then a movie like this comes along, like I said, is so not preachy. It's so accessible that uh, I'm convinced people of no faith um, will connect with it, will relate to it. And that's where I think we need to go next. I think we need to get beyond just the sermons on film and get to films that speak to everybody the way other films do. And again, this is a small film. It's up against massive, you know, films with massive, massive budgets. But but you know what, you... Passion of the Christ, a massive success. I know Sound of Freedom isn't yours, but your your actor from, I mean, Jim Caviezel um, goes and crushes it in Sound of Freedom. Um, there, There's an appetite for it, right? And to your point about small films, Sound of Freedom, they go out, they crush it. They're up against all these huge Hollywood films and they beat it. Do you, do you are, I mean, do you have any thought that this might be the blockbuster breakout because of the message? Well, listen, we, we always pray for that to happen. We know that realistically speaking, um, you know, it's not a normal theatrical run, so it's not even at the level of Sound of Freedom. 
But we believe that um, the theatrical run, however successful, and hopefully we will have some good success, it's really the, the locomotive that carries the brand, it carries the movie. A movie without a theatrical theater release is is going to be at a whole lower level than any of the movies that get in theaters. So just the fact that it's getting into theaters and will hopefully have a respectable uh, showing at theaters will help it in all the other windows it goes to. So, so just, you're the business guy. Walk me through this for a second. Let's say you you have these 800 theaters and you know and and people flock to it tonight you you will have you mention that again before we we wrap up but tonight it does very very well what is that then what happens like like how does the market react yeah so uh, a lot of your uh subsequent windows all those deals hinge on a theatrical what, what happens at theatrical so again most smaller movies never get a theatrical release and so they really struggle to get any kind of love um, from the streamers, from TV deals, all the other windows, as I say, revenue streams. A theatrical release jumps it up to a different level. And then depending upon how it does theatrically, there's even metrics sometimes where streamers will say, well, based on this amount of money, we're going to give you this amount of money um, as a license fee for the film to be able to put it on our platform. Either way, um, the theatrical release is very important. There's a lot of publicity, like the interview I'm doing with you, that's happening all over the country with all kinds of different outlets. That type of stuff doesn't normally happen for just a movie that's going to streaming. It happens for movies that open in theaters. Okay. Um, and, and so if we can get people to go out and, and just buy a ticket, that helps the, the, the movement. Okay. All right. It, so, this is this is election day. It's this, this movie is. <laughs> I, is a I love how you candidate. think. It's a political candidate. We're not going to get a second chance like tomorrow. Oh, I forgot to vote. You know, today. No, the, the precincts are going to be open. The movie's going to be out there. Your ticket is your vote. This is the moment that you get that candidate elected. That you send a message to Hollywood that says. No, 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 we like this platform. Right. We like this candidate. We want more of these type of candidates and we will vote for these people with our dollars. So has the, uh, the, the, the actors, and I know the writers wrapped up their strike, but because there hasn't been a bunch of Hollywood releases, does that help or hurt you? Uh, it helps a little bit, but there's enough. The, the, the whole industry has shifted now where there's uh, a lot fewer movies coming out but they're doing big numbers like Barbie numbers are just in, like incredible numbers. I think yeah. most of us thought we would never get back to those numbers at the box office, five, $600 million films at the box office. And that's just us, right? Um, you know, billion dollar worldwide. So we still have a lot of competition. Um, but yeah, it helps. It helps a little. The, okay. the strike has also hurt us. Um, it, there were various promotional things we were going to be doing with other well-known actors who love Mother Teresa and they couldn't do anything because they can't, they can't be perceived to be promoting not only their own film, but any film right, right. now. Well, I, I know that uh, we can do whatever we can for you. Um, why don't you repeat again where we can go to get tickets to find out where to see it? Yeah, so first thing, just Google your local movie theaters, see if you can find it showing in any theater. If you don't, immediately, then go to fathomevents.com, search for Mother Teresa and me, it'll come right up. It might even be on the homepage when you get there. And just type in your zip code, you'll see what theaters are close to you. And please go out, uh, take your friends and family. This is an amazing film for young women, especially. If there's young women in your life, college, high school age, boy, this is a movie to take them to. Um, they'll really relate to Kavita and everything she's going through in the movie. All right. Paul Lauer, congrats on the movie. Like I said, go see it tonight, Fathom Events. Even if you can't see it, folks, I know it's late uh, when this is dropping and when the movie is tight. Go buy the ticket. This is an effort that we should be supporting uh, and helping. Uh, you, you have a track record uh, that speaks volumes to where you put your time and effort, mm. and I'd love to be uh, supportive of that. So, Paul, thanks for being with us today. Thank you for having us. You bet.
All right, that was a lively discussion with Larry O'Connor and Grant Cinchfield. I appreciate them being with us. And go see that movie, Paul Lauer and that film, Mother Teresa and Me. What a great way to support uh, the efforts that he's making. A great story, a great movie. Um, tomorrow, Nancy Mace is here. She voted to vacate that chair and to get rid of Kevin McCarthy. Where do we stand with her? We're in a little rapid fire with her as well. I'll see you back here tomorrow on The Sean Spicer Show. Thanks for subscribing. Make sure you go to Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Rumble. Give us five stars on Apple Podcasts. It means a lot. Thanks a lot. Well, if you enjoyed this content, make sure to like this video, subscribe, and click the notification bell to get more.